Thank you very much indeed, Barry, and good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you sincerely for inviting me. It's a tremendous honor to be with you here today and a real pleasure to be delivering the ST Lee Distinguished Lecture. I've been visiting Singapore for many years and it possesses a higher education sector of which it must rightly be proud. Its rise in the international league tables of universities reflects concerted leadership by university leaders, by civil servants, and by the government itself. In the two league tables that are based most on world citations and rankings, um, I note that both NUS and NTU are in the top 90 in the Times higher rankings, and both are in the top 50 in the QS rankings. Indeed, if I may be permitted to say so, I think the strategy underlining Singapore's investment in higher education and research is an exemplary case of what I want to talk about today. If I can also add one further personal comment, I have, as a member of the RSIS board since 2007, seen exactly that kind of international leadership in action, so that what started life as a think tank focused on defence and security studies has, under your leadership, Barry, become one of the leading centres for the study of international relations in the world. I feel privileged to be associated both with RSIS and NTU. My focus today is on the major trends in higher education and knowledge economies. Wherever you are in the world, the issues affecting higher education look remarkably similar. Of course, how you choose to tackle those issues varies from country to country. But I believe that we face many of the same pressures and thus we have much to learn from each other as a consequence. In particular, some national governments are reducing or radically altering their financial support for higher education, which means that universities are being forced to reinvent themselves to survive and flourish in the future. This presents us with challenges, but also offers exciting opportunities to break free from traditional ways of doing things. And, and this is a key theme for me today, although there clearly are many areas in which we're competing against one another, collaborating internationally is absolutely vital for all universities if they are going to prosper in the future. Indeed, I want to argue, as my core claim today, that international collaboration is the way for institutions and countries to win the race to the top because of how international research is now being undertaken. But one thing is certain, universities have an absolutely major part to play in the future prosperity of our nations, and that is, for me, an underlying foundational assumption of what I'm going to say. So, I'm going to talk about four things. Let me just summarize the argument so that hopefully you'll all be able to follow it through as we get there. First, there's much talk in nations around the world of winning the global race. In fact, we're very pleased to see that our Prime Minister in Britain now, uh, I think in his last international visit, took 51 seconds to mention the, word winning the, the words winning the global race. Um, we think that it's become instantiated in our thinking, but how can universities contribute to that? How do we contribute to national prosperity? There are many ways in which we can and already do. Obviously, the economic dimension, which is critically important, but also the social, educational, and cultural contributions that universities make as well. They are socio-economic as well as economic powerhouses, and they are anchor institutions, a key phrase for me, anchor institutions in their cities and communities. So I'm going to begin in a few minutes by exploring a seminal UK government report authored by Lord Sainsbury of Turville, then Minister of Science and now Chancellor of the University of Cambridge. It was published in 2007 called The Race to the Top. I pay homage to this outstanding report in the title of my lecture today. Looking principally at the UK, 
It argues that the future uh, economy has to be a knowledge-based economy and that the UK has a choice about its economic future, either to try and win a race to the bottom on low skills and low wages, or focus on winning a race to the top by being one of the major knowledge economies in the world, led by, based on, cutting-edge research coming out of its universities. Universities for Lord Sainsbury are the single most important ingredient in successful knowledge economies across the globe. This argument, I think, is now accepted in many countries around the world and is the foundation, I think, on which many national economic policies are being built. Secondly, I want to argue that continued state investment in higher education, and particularly in research, is critically important. It's, in fact, imperative if national efforts to win the global race in job and wealth creation are going to succeed. In Europe, there's no doubt that many of us currently operate in a very challenging economic climate. Reduced public spending on higher education and research could put the long-term sustainability of our countries and indeed our universities in jeopardy. But more importantly, there is a gradual shift around the world from the state paying to the graduate or the student paying. And this is altering the expectations of students and parents alike. In England, it is also fundamentally transforming the culture within institutions. I'll talk about the changes in the funding environment in England as a case study and what effects these have had on the nature of higher education and public attitudes towards universities. Thirdly, I'm going to look at one of the key effects of reduced or more targeted public expenditure on R&D, which is the global trend towards greater international research funding concentration and the importance of transnational research collaboration in the future. All the evidence shows that in research, international cooperation creates citation levels that significantly exceed the world average. In the 21st century, collaboration is indisputably one of the key characteristics of world-class successful universities. Singapore is doing much that others can emulate in this area. But note, concentration of research creates winners and losers. Fourthly and finally, I'm going to say a few words about international student mobility and the challenges presented by changing student expectations and, and candidly in the UK by the government's current immigration policy. The free movement of students, researchers and academics is an absolutely essential ingredient of a successful knowledge economy. In the UK we are having an absolutely fierce debate about how immigration policy threatens this and how we can ensure that the best minds continue to be attracted to studying in, amongst other places, our universities, and that they're not inadvertently deterred by measures designed to crack down on illegal immigration. So the race to the top. My starting point is the observation that the economic and social role of higher education is rapidly changing in response to global economic forces. Nations around the world are talking about the importance of winning the global race, particularly in the face of the astonishing economic development of China and India. The political and, in and economic global map is being redrawn and all nations are rallying to ensure that they can keep up with the competition. In the UK, David Cameron's economic, trade and diplomatic policy is predicated on the idea that Britain must improve its international standing on a range of key measures and thus win the global race for jobs and wealth. The government is pursuing this policy in a number of ways. The good news is that education generally and universities specifically are acknowledged as having a central role to play in that central role to play in ensuring that the UK succeeds. Some figures from the UK that just astonish me, and there's many more I could have given, but, but these I think are critical. 
In the UK, the estimate is by 2020, 82% of newly created jobs will require a degree, and that the top 10 in-demand jobs in 2010 were in industries that didn't exist in 2004. So we, in universities, are currently preparing our students for jobs that have not even been conceived of yet. Two-thirds of UK growth between 2007, 2000 and 2007 came from knowledge and innovation-intensive sectors of the economy. And as you know, and as I'll say more on in a second, we're in a, quite a bad slump in the UK economy. But only 2% of the job losses in the last five years have been in knowledge-intensive industries. There's a pattern here, there's a trend here, and it's critically important. Education systems around the world have to understand these trends and be designed, I suppose, to be appropriate so that our citizens have the necessary educational attainment to prosper in the future. Now, the UK has a very, very strong performing um, higher education system. We are a, we are a world-class system and we are second only to the United States in our performance on a wide range of measures. Higher education is rather surprisingly our seventh largest export industry, worth now 10.2 billion pounds a year. The Russell Group of leading research universities alone have a total economic output of around 30 billion pounds per year. And the estimates are that by 2025, that, that 10.2 billion of export earnings is on course to become 17 billion. So it's a, in its own right a significant industry. But like many Western nations, the UK is in the grip of a program of austerity, and there's a real threat posed to universities by the lack of public funding available. And there are other domestic policy pressures as well, such as immigration. Lord Sainsbury's review of the UK government science and innovation policies in 2007 said that the best way for the UK to compete in an era of globalization was to move into high value goods, services and industry. The UK, and this I think holds true for many developed nations, so should seek to compete with emerging economies in a race to the top by having the higher level skills and research based industries that would lead to future success in the world economy, rather than, as I said, engaging in a race to the bottom on wage rates. Now, winning the race to the top requires investment in the innovation ecosystem. The research which underpins Lord Sainsbury's recommendations supports the argument that higher education and particularly research-intensive universities are key agents of economic regeneration in the region and critical generators of knowledge-based industry. Research-intensive universities in particular have a key role to play in generating curiosity-driven research and knowledge transfer, attracting high technology clusters around them, and spinning out highly competitive companies. Crucially, the report shows that locality is important even within a globalized economy and thus skills, knowledge, and industry are often concentrated in the same area. Lord Sainsbury argued that we must, and I quote, guard against a situation where all our universities aim for the same goals. That's a simple statement, but very controversial. He added, we should have diversity of excellence with blue skies research confined to a subset of the research intensive universities. This for him was because the evidence bears out the assumption that R&D based and venture backed companies locate around high quality research universities to a far greater extent than around lower quality research institutions. The findings of the report provide me with the backdrop for this lecture. The lesson is that in order to succeed in the global race, the importance of investing in our universities is absolutely unequivocal. Lord Sainsbury concluded that the UK can be one of the winners in the race to the top, but only if we run fast. Global investment in higher education is increasing, 
And there are some countries, the UK included, that risk being left behind. In this sense, I firmly believe that Sainsbury's logic applies to all knowledge economies. But the core conclusion to be drawn from his report is not a comfortable one for university and political leaders alike. This is because the race to the top is above all a call to fund research resources selectively, resulting in a concentration of research in a subset of universities. That is now very much a feature of the UK higher education system, or more accurately for my lecture, the English higher education system. Of 110 universities in England, about 80% of research income goes to 25 of them. And this concentration is slowly increasing as a result of a perceived need to allocate resources even more selectively in order to let English universities compete globally. Even more controversially, government-funded PhD scholarships run by the seven research councils are now being limited to a subset of universities that are part of things called DTCs, doctoral training centers, of which there are between a dozen and 18 um, in various subjects. As I'll argue later on, the government's response to austerity has been to protect in cash terms the research resource budget, but this in turn requires further selectivity in research funding. This creates winners and losers, and as you can imagine, to, it leads to significant debate within higher education circles as to what is the right level of distribution of research resource. I would claim that exactly this debate is happening in every knowledge economy, since all of them are having to compete in a global race to the top. The leading universities in a country are not competing with other institutions in that country as much as they're increasingly in competition with other leading universities around the world. To use a football or soccer analogy, it is a European Champions League, even a World Cup, not the UK Premier League. Now, I want to turn to public investment. Universities in many countries are being compelled to diversify their traditional income streams and redefine their core missions as a result of economic stagnation, particularly in Europe. In addition, the process of the marketization of higher education is creating alternative pressures where entrepreneurialism and innovation are the key to success more than ever before. In the UK, we now have a system in which the financial burden of higher education has shifted from the state to the graduate. Inevitably, this has huge implications for us, for the type of experiences we provide our students, for our relationship with government, for how we fund the core activities of teaching and research, for how we engage with our partners around the world, and, crucially, in how we engage with our students and what they expect from us. And we face the future against the continuing global financial crisis, the effects of which are sadly far-reaching and long-lasting in Europe. The UK is struggling to emerge from a double-dip recession, and it's estimated that as of July 2013, the UK economy remains 3.3% below where it was in the first quarter of 2008. By way of contrast, India and China have grown economically by a stunning 40% and 60% respectively since 2008. So as China's gone up 60%, we're down 3.3%. Indeed, the OECD rather remarkably predicted recently that by 2025, the combined GDPs of China and India will together be bigger than those of France, Germany, Italy, Japan, the US, the UK, and Canada combined. UK universities have been fortunate because during this time of austerity, our government has accepted that universities are at the heart of economic growth and be, should be invested in. They are located in ministerial governmental terms in the Department for Business, um, not the Department of Education. But austerity 
means that we risk our position and reputation because other countries are investing more, in some cases much more. Public investment in higher education globally is a mixed picture, but as a proportion of GDP, UK investment is outstripped by other countries. The total UK investment in higher education is now 1.4% of GDP, according to the latest OECD figures. That's half of that of the United States and below the OECD average of 1.6%. And UK public investment, that is by the state, is only 0.7% of GDP, which is lower than Brazil, Russia, or any other Western European country. It's identical to the Slovak Republic. Now, the new English higher education system has undergone enormous change in the last five years. I was president of Universities UK from 2009 to 2011, which is the UK is the body that represents all universities. So I was involved in, in, in the negotiations on the new funding mechanism. As you'll know, maybe in England, maximum tuition fees moved from 3,300 to 9,000 a year for home EU undergraduates from last year. Critically, students do not pay up front. Graduates repay the cost of their education only when they're employed and only when they're earning more than £21,000 a year. Average wages are about 26000 And maintenance loans and grants are more generous than before. But the key thing to say, the key fact, you just need to remember one thing, under the British system, they are loans, but they're loans of a kind because they're written off after 30 years. These changes were introduced alongside a massive change in the way government funded universities. In a simple sentence, governments withdrew block grants to universities and we now got our money through the fees, the deferred fees paid by the student. The fees are advanced to us by the government and they get the repayment from the student. So about three billion a year was taken out of the money going to universities. So the result is an interesting one. According to the latest data, only 25.2% of the English expenditure on higher education comes from the state compared to the OECD average of 68.4% and Singapore where government meets about 75% of tuition fee through block grant. But as a result, paradoxically, and despite some of the rhetoric, the income to English universities is increasing rather significantly. By 2015, we estimate that in real terms, English universities will have about 10% more funding for teaching than they had in 2012. Despite these apparently cost-neutral changes, the problem we've got in Britain actually is what happens over the next three or four years. Um, I've just put a, a couple of figures up there that you'll see. The core point is that we look as if we're in the grip of austerity till probably 2020. That means 12 years of austerity, with 33 billion pounds of cuts scheduled for whoever wins the election in 2015. For the department that we're located in, the estimate is that the funding to the Department of Business, Innovation and Skills will be cut between 2010 and 2018 by a total of 43%. So these are significant changes, and it's that light you have to think about when you're thinking about what government has done by protecting research. There are two effects of this, by the way. The obvious first one is it's going to limit our ability to build infrastructure, large, expensive capital research projects. The other issue, of course, is that although we've got a cash protection of research funding for eight years, it looks like, it's not uplisted for inflation every year. So in real terms, from 2010 to 2018, research funding looks as if it falls by around 23% in real terms. To, um, to cut to the chase, really, how does government respond to this? It either just doles out the cuts equally or it allocates the money more selectively, and I think the betting is clear that it's going to be the selectivity route that is followed. These have changed the nature of university life in Britain a bit, and uh, certainly in England. Whether, of course, uh, it, what the effects in the long term will be are up for grabs. 
The worry at the time was it would alter the pattern of student recruitment and it would put students from poor backgrounds off attending universities. All I can say here is at the moment what we're seeing is actually the continuation of trends that existed before the fee change in 2012 and I'll just say a word or two about those. I chair the admission service in Britain. We had a results day yesterday so it was a bit mad. Um, but uh, the latest data shows that 2012, when fees were introduced, we did see a decline in students going to university, but it turned out to be a one-year dip. For 2013 entry, we've actually had about 3.5% more students apply. That's significant because the cohort of 18, 19-year-olds is declining at the moment quite significantly. In fact, there are now 7 to 8% fewer 18-year-olds in the UK than there were in 2009, about 60,000. So the increase in applications is actually rather encouraging. So the signs thus far is that students have not been put off going to university. Indeed, government yesterday published some research showing that the added income you get from studying a degree after paying taxes, after paying all the fees, is for women about £252,000 in a lifetime and a bit less for men. So it seems to be the case that participation in universities has actually um, uh, increased. We are worried by one or two uh, minor issues. We're worried about a drift of students at the very top going abroad. Do remember the endowment fund for Harvard is four times as large as all British universities' endowment funds put together. Um, the other issue, which I won't spend much time now on, but it's a very big issue in Britain, um, is the socioeconomic background of the students going to university. The worry there was students from poor backgrounds would be put off by the tripling of fees. What's actually happened is that last year we saw the lowest socioeconomic group actually increase its participation rate. The reason isn't difficult to fathom, it's that the grant and support system is more generous. So now, that, the, the lowest socioeconomic quintile um, is now 19.8% likely to go to university. That's the participation rate. Mind you, the participation rate, if you happen to be in the richest groups in society, is nearly three times as great as that. So although the reforms don't seem to have knocked progr the progressive nature of participation, um, there remains, nonetheless, issues underlying um, social class participation in British universities. In terms of student choice, the early evidence is that the fee increase has led to a rise in the interest of clinical and STEM subjects. Um, arts, humanities and social sciences have stayed roughly okay. The biggest problem is the decline in stu students in England studying modern languages, but that is a trend that's been going problematically for the UK for many years. We don't think it's an effect of fees. The other change is what I've put on the slide there is a flight to quality. All I mean there, and I think it's a very significant point, we're seeing students with the very highest grades choosing to study at a much smaller range of universities. Um, they're deciding to go to a small group of institutions so that I think 40% of students getting the top grades go to 10 of the 120 or so UK universities. And I want to turn to global research funding concentration. And for me, this is the real meaty bit of the lecture. It's the thing where I think the really big issues arise. If winners and losers are apparent in student recruitment as a result of the changes, the pattern is more clear-cut and controversial in the area of research. It might be said that the, the effects of the emerging market in higher education in the UK are most palpable here as the level of concentration uh, uh, increases over uh, the last few years. In Singapore, your higher education leaders and policymakers have done an exceptional job of raising the international standing of your higher education system even further in recent years. I note with real pride, Singapore recently broke into the top 10 to be ninth in the international study undertaken by Universitas 
21. Universitas 21 ranks 50 countries on measures such as the amount of money put in, um, on the international connectivity of institutions, but also on research output. Singapore's conscious strategy to internationalize by recruiting world-class researchers and students and undertaking significant global research uh, collaboration, that's been incredibly successful, and I congratulate you on the success. Singapore does particularly well in the amount of resource it puts into its higher education. It ranks eighth in the world in the amount of money that it puts into uh, its research activity. And according to a report carried out by the Economist Intelligence Unit, re unit recently, um, Singapore is now seen as the fifth most successful education superpower in the world. That's great. The UK is ranked in the Universitas 21 rankings. Just behind Singapore, we're 10th. But what's interesting about Britain, and there's a lot more, a lot of thinking has to go on after when you think about the data that now coming, where the UK does brilliantly is on outputs, as a measure of research output and research excellence. Um, where we are second in the world behind the United States, but the UK lags in the input side, we only rank 24th in the world on the amount we spend on our higher education system. We rank second in the outputs, both research and students' uh, quality uh, in terms of the number of students taught per head of the population. We rank second on outputs, 24th on inputs. So we've got a paradox. For the UK, can we continue to punch above our weight in research without spending more in public investment? Only two knowledge economies, China and the UK, in the Universitas 21 study, significantly outperform their outputs in relationship to their inputs. China is 46th on resource, 27th on outputs, the UK is 24th on resource and second on outputs. Singapore is in a slightly different position. Singapore is indeed eighth on research, uh, oh sorry, eighth on inputs, but it's 18th on outputs. So I think there's some very interesting questions emerge about how research resources spent and for UK, the issue is, can we go on outperforming? For Singapore, the question would be, will the continued investment lead to a change in the relative research position of the Singapore institutions? For the UK, I think it's worth reflecting on just one set of data. And I apologize for running through these, but they are important. The UK spends 4% of the world's gross expenditure on research. It employs 6% of the world's researchers who author 8% of the world's research articles. These papers attract 11% of the world's citations, 14% of the most highly cited work, and those exceptional articles we include, in the UK produces 17% of the world's research papers with more than 500 citations and 20% of those with more than 1,000 citations. Our average research impact then surpasses that of the UK, of the USA. But with research funding protected only in cash terms, we're not certain that this result will continue. Despite a funding freeze then, there's a real risk um, for research in the UK because we think that that research budget will not be increased in cash terms for an eight-year period. As I mentioned, UK research councils are working with fewer institutions on doctoral training, but we think there's a global trend, which I've just hinted at with those uh, examples there, throughout the world whereby large numbers of knowledge economies are increasingly concentrating their resource. Japan, with its, its leading PhD initiative, um, the scheme offers substantial funding to support less than 50 
um, of the top performing interdisciplinary PhD programs that partner with industry. In the USA, only 614 institutions offer PhDs out of 7,000. China puts a large amount of money into just 100 of its institutions. The Le Excellence Initiative in Germany is to create nine, nine world-class universities. In France, 33 institutions out of 160 get two-thirds of the money. In South Korea, in Australia, in Taiwan, and in Canada, you get a similar process. South Korea's Brain 21 program is designed to achieve 10 globally competitive research universities. But I'm interested in the next point. This seems to me not just an issue about university research. Professor Peter Nolan's recent work, Is China Buying the World?, found that the world economy is in the process of being transformed by the emergence of a limited number of dominant businesses almost entirely based in advanced countries. For example, the world market in carbonated drinks is dominated by two companies, mobile telecommunications infrastructure by three, personal computers by four, beer by four. He also found that, the, that 100 companies account for over three-fifths of the total R&D expenditure amongst the world's top 1,400 companies. And in addition to concentration, the success of universities is defined by having a large number of international research collaborations. And if any of you want to follow this up, I would recommend in the strongest possible terms an article by Jonathan Adams in Nature in May of this year, in which he talks about the fourth age of research. If anyone's interested, it's a fascinating piece. He said research started off being individual, then institutional, then national. It's now international. What's happening then is around the world, in the trend for international research is that it's increasingly being carried out in more than one country. So, most papers now in the UK are authored with people who are also based outside the UK. Only 47% of the UK's publications now, uh, uh, in 2000, the latest figures, 48% in 2012, the latest data I've got is 47% is now um, are, are domestic. It was 85% in the 80s. In the US, though, two-thirds of the output is still domestic. In China, 75% of its research is produced in country. The point I want to slow down and stress is this sentence. Papers that are co-authored with people based in more than one country have, on average, over 50% more citations than those written by individuals or groups of individuals in one country. There's a long-term trend here as to what kind of university structure we're getting in the world. And without continued and sustained investment, therefore, I worry that nations could risk their reputations for research excellence and their place at the top table. Lastly, before concluding, I'd like to say something about international student mobility. The international student market grew 59% between 2000 and 2007, varied performance across countries. One interesting fact to remember in this, of course, is in uh, the worldwide demographic dip in the OECD countries, by 2025, the number of 18 to 24-year-olds in the OECD declines by 9%. The UK has been successful in growing its international student numbers in the last decade, up from 8 to 12%, an 80% increase in the number of those students coming to the UK from Asia and the Middle East. The UK has increased its market share to 13% in 2010. And as I said, we now estimate in July this year that universities bring in 10.2 billion pounds a year to the UK uh, economy. Movement of students between countries is thus a key feature of modern university life. More than 2.8 million students were enrolled in universities uh, outside of their country um, of citizenship in 2007. That's an increase uh, year on year of about four to five percent. 
11 countries host 71% of the world's mobile students, led by the US with 21.3%. Rather worryingly for us in Britain, in 2007, almost half, 42%, of postgraduate research students in the UK were from abroad. But in the UK, domestic immigration policy threatens inward migration, despite a government target of increasing international student numbers by 20% over five years. I and many other vice chancellors support a robust UK immigration system that roots out illegal immigration, but like any regulation, the rules have to be fair and proportionate and cognizant of wider implications. The higher education sector in the UK finds the overall stance taken by the UK government worrying and genuinely damaging the, the nation's long-term future. By including international students in the definition of net migration, which our government has said it is going to continue to do, it's also said it's going to include, uh, it's going to reduce um, uh, net migration from the hundreds of thousands to the tens of thousands. By including students in that, those numbers, the government risks, I think, shooting itself in the foot when it's turning to the universities as an engine of growth. If we were producing cars and widgets, the government would be backing us to the hilt as an export industry. But because immigration is such a toxic political issue um, in the UK, there is a really difficult problem whereby um, you could argue that the high watermark has been met for this export industry. There have been some positive moves. The government is going to report immigration um, figures to separate students from non-students, but at the moment they are going to be included in the overall target. The problem is, of course, we think as university leaders that students are not migrants, they're students. They only become migrants when they cease being a student and then decide to stay. So we argue that the UK should follow the practice of the USA, Australia and Canada in excluding students from the net migration figures. But I have to tell you, as of the moment, this, our government does not think that it can do that because it feels vulnerable to the argument of fiddling the figures on an issue, immigration, that is toxic in the political system. I'd like to conclude. How do nations like ours, like Singapore, like the UK, succeed in the global race? Well, here's how to make sure you fail. Don't invest in research and development. Don't invest in skills in order to ensure that there are sufficient levels of prior attainment at 16. Spread your research resource as thinly as possible and put up barriers to immigration which deter international students and staff from studying in your country. Singapore is undoubtedly doing none of these things and the results you have achieved are truly impressive and inspiring and I confidently predict your comparative position will improve. The core challenges facing all knowledge economies are first to ensure that they invest sufficiently in the higher education systems. The OECD average is 1.6% of GDP. Second, they need to distribute those resources in the most effective manner. In my view, that means concentrating research resources so that the leading institutions can compete with those knowledge economies investing much more in higher education. Thirdly, they have to promote international collaboration since all the evidence shows us that the probability of reaching high citation levels increases markedly if research is undertaken by academics working in more than one knowledge economy. Fourth, they have to promote and support the movement of students and staff between international partners and not see it as a game solely to do with student recruitment. Fifth, they have to ensure that PhD students are trained in institutions or consortia that have sufficient critical mass to provide internationally competitive research training. And sixth, they have to invest sufficiently in R&D. In fact, as I was reviewing this lecture in my hotel room this morning, it struck me that this is probably, for me, the absolute key. Um, the latest data from 2012, by the way, shows that the UK invests 1.76% of its GDP um, in R&D. 
and the OECD average is 2.4. Now, in the British political debate, what happens immediately is someone says, well, 1.76, 2.4, they're not very different. Um, the rather worrying thought is they're roughly 50% uh, different. Uh, uh, there's a 50% increase on the one over the other. The US spends 2.77, Singapore 2.3, but Germany 2.84, Japan 3.3, Sweden 3.4, Korea 3.7, Finland 3.8. We could discuss just those figures. There is a real need to invest in R&D. Seventhly, in order to get the level of resource we're going to need in the future in our universities, it's essential that universities, and I think I mean here academic colleagues, are absolutely willing to embrace the notion of the impact of their research outside the academic realm. After all, if we want to get public resource, we've got to be able to explain in a reasonably coherent sentence, hope, hopefully with one or two facts, how that research aids the countries we're living in and helps the people that are paying for this. That's going to require a significant reorientation of traditional academic sensibilities, but it's an absolute requirement for me for obtaining state finance in the future. Finally, I think those knowledge economies that succeed will be those that can overcome the tired, stark alternatives of public-private, academic administrator, pure applied. In all of the above, you will notice that this implies an acceptance of the marketization of higher education, not simply within a knowledge economy, but increasingly between them. Now, of course, there are other major trends that I could have discussed today, mainly to do with the changing balance between public and private, sources of funding, and the very different forms of course delivery opening up, especially in, at the moment, MOOCs. But in my view, these changes have much to do, more to do with the teaching and student role of universities. From my perspective, the core global driver there is going to do, be to do with the massive increase in the world's middle classes who will want the same kind of positional goods as existing middle classes, and this equates to a significant long-term increase in university enrollments, placing a particular premium, a premium on high-ranking institutions. In India, the plan is to increase the number of students from 23 million to 70 million. Um, anecdotally, I can report that the Minister of uh, Human Resource Development there told us that he needs 775,000 new academic staff. I told him I had a couple uh, I could give him. Um, uh, this, of course, will lead to a greater di a differentiation between institutions, between the form of course studied, how it's delivered, and I think this will result in a greater differentiation of institutions in the market. So, really to wind things up, just to reiterate a couple of points. Firstly, one thing is certain, universities have no option but to adapt to these wider economic and social and political trends. The processes of marketization and globalization, I think, are working together to create a very different higher education environment to the one we had a decade ago. I think these forces affect us all, and we've got to learn from each other's experience. Second point, I also think we need to think what internationalization means for our universities. It's about internationalizing all our activities, our curricula, research, our interactions with industry and society, and more, more, more widely. It's therefore, I think, beholden on university leaders to articulate what internationalization means for their institutions and to map a path to success on the international stage. We absolutely must not retrench to national boundaries in an increasingly austere environment. If I may, I'd like to end, really, with two quotes. The first is back from Lord Sainsbury in Race to the Top. Quote, There are those who claim that industrially we live on a flat earth, where geography is no longer important and where talented individuals roam across the globe competing on a level playing field. But while the world may be flat for industries producing simple labor-intensive products and services, for knowledge-intensive goods and services, the landscape is full of hills and mountains where skills, knowledge, and infrastructure are concentrated. My second quote is from the May 2013 Nature paper by Jonathan Adams, and it chills me to say this sentence. 
Institutions that do not form international collaborations risk progressive disenfranchisement. And countries that do not nurture talent will lose entirely. So what I think they're both saying is that global competition amongst knowledge economies is fierce. Investment in higher education and research and in our best minds must be sustained. If countries like Singapore and the UK are to remain relevant leading 21st century economies, then we need healthy, well-funded universities to generate knowledge and innovation, to produce skills for the future, and ultimately to reinforce our international competitiveness. And we must all articulate this message within our own university communities, to our political leaders, to policymakers, and the wider society. We must continue to make the argument that to invest in our universities is essential, and we almost so must make the argument about the need for greater international collaboration. And as my final sentences, I just want to say, although universities and knowledge economies compete, we have an enormous amount to gain by the cooperation that's taking place between knowledge economies and between leading research universities. This is for two reasons. First, it's not simply the only way to ensure greater research impact, but more importantly, it's because it's the path to the discovery of, of the solutions to the greatest problems facing humanity. Thank you very much.